Hello, everyone. My name is uh, David Li Daokui, or David Li. I'm a professor of economics at the School of Economics and Management of Tsinghua University. I'm also the dean of the Schwarzman Scholars Program. Today, let's talk about an interesting topic, I think. That is China's worldview. First, let's try to understand why China is interesting. Well, Chinese economy is already the second largest in the world. I assure you, there are many, many second largest economies in the world in history, like Germany of before World War I, like Japan uh, until 2010 or 2011, before being taken over by China, being number two in the world. But most number twos in the world run into economic trouble and even political trouble one way or the other. The German economy, uh, after Bismarck running the country so successfully, ran into World War I with many major countries in the world. The Japanese economy ran into a 20-year slump, which China, Japan is still working hard to rescue. But I would argue that today's China is even more intriguing than all those in history as number two in the world. Why is that? First, the size. I call size matters. China, even though being number two in the world, is the largest in size in terms of population. It accounts for almost 20% of the world's population. Whereas Germany accounts for around 2% give or take. Well, Japan accounts for 1.8 percent, roughly 2 percent of the global population. And Germany, slightly over 1 percent of the world's population. Now you may wonder, what's the relationship between population and the economy? Well, economists can tell you many, many stories. Here, let me use some examples or stories to illustrate. This is the picture of the size of the automobile market, auto market in the world. Today, China is the largest automobile market in the world, accounting for 28% of the world's auto sales every year. Today's Chinese auto sales is over 23 million units a year, much larger than 18 million, which was the record of the American the US automobile sales. Again, you can ask, what's the implication of the size of the automobile market? Well, here's an example, a story. Can you recognize the first car on the top? The car has a very cute name in China, called QQ. QQ in Chinese pronunciation means very cute, very small. Interestingly, this car is not only the cute car, a QQ car in the world, there's another model under the name of Chevrolet or Chevy called Spark. Look at them, almost the same. Who copied whom? You may imagine. It is a Chinese producer, Sherry, who copied the American General Motors before financial crisis, mind you, before financial crisis. What would be the normal reaction of American company or international company when it says, when it says its own car Hardly the very carefully designed cute car being totally copied by a foreign company. Go to the court. That's American culture. Did the GM go to court to sue Chinese company Sherry? No. Why is that? GM chose not to go to the court to sue Sherry. Why is that? Because at this time, GM was trying to enter the Chinese market. GM, after a lot of debate, internal debate, realized that, yes, GM may win the legal case, but the GM may lose the whole war getting into China. GM was right, because GM China was the most profitable branch of General Motors, still today. And that was the case right after the financial crisis. And it was, I would argue, because of the Chinese operation of GM, which quickly made GM come back 
and made GM to be able to be relisted in the US stock exchange. GM was bankrupt, by the way. 75% of GM's shares were held by the American, the US federal government, and the Canadian federal government. So this example shows us size matters. Sometimes a big size of a market can change the, the rule of the game, the implicit rule of the game. One, another example. On top, you can see a picture of something very old, very strange. Very strange to you, young audience, young students, but familiar to me. These are the flash memories of 30 years ago. Today we have fresh memories as small as a small fingertip to memorize movies. But that days, when I was in your age, I was using VCRs. Remember VCRs? Video recorders to record NBA games when I miss them. I would try to tell my friends, don't tell me the outcome. I will video it, I tape it, I put timer before I leave, and then I come back home, I watch the game. VCR was not invented by Japan. Maybe it invented by, I don't know. But the Japanese company, Sony, invented a very good format of video recording, which was beta. A small tape, high quality, very dense, being able to record hours of movies. And then there's a competing format called VHS. VHS is non-Japanese format. And arguably, technically, the VHS is much inferior to the beta format. Much bigger, much unreliable, and lower quality. Guess what? Today, nobody remembers VHS or beta. But 10 years ago, still, people still remember VHS. VHS became the popular model. Just like Samsung being able to overcome Nokia. VHS, an inferior model, an inferior technology, take over the market, not the better one. Why? I would argue, size. The Japanese market was not big enough to carry even a wonderful technology like beta. That's the size. Another example of size matters is mobile phone. We all use mobile phones, right? The mobile phones were designed by I think Motorola, I may be wrong, I'm not an engineer. Feel free to correct me. And the format of the mobile phone is a critical issue. There have been three formats in the world, GSM, used in mostly continental Europe, and also partly in the US, CD, CDMA being used in the US. The Chinese wanted to have its own format, called TD, TD format. And 10 years ago, very few people believed the TD format could fly. But today, the TD format is serving as many as 500 million customers. And many other countries are also using the TD format. So this shows us size matters. Well, money also matters, right? We study economics, we study business. Money matters, that's easy. But let me explain to you how money matters in the case of China. China is having the world's highest savings rates. I'm talking about national savings rate. Every year, about 50% of Chinese GDP is saved aside, not consumed. And these high savings has been able to prompt China to accumulate a huge amount of money. How much? Almost 20 trillion the equivalent, the equivalent of US dollar inside China. Chinese money stock is the largest by far in the world. In this chart, I show that Chinese M2, we call money broadly defined, including cash and deposits, bank deposits, accounts for almost 200% of Chinese GDP, which is around 10 trillion US dollar. And the second highest in the world is Euro. The whole Eurozone has about 11 trillion US dollar among the money stock. And then Japan, 8.5 trillion. The US dollar is 11 trillion. So the proper ranking of the size of money stock is China, 
Europe, US, and Japan. Money is everywhere in China. How much in terms of China's deposit in foreign countries? Chinese households deposit money in Chinese banks, and Chinese banks in turn deposit some of its money in foreign banks because China has too much money. Four trillion US dollar. How much is four trillion US dollar? We call currency reserves. Well, if Chinese government wants to do, which they wouldn't do, don't be scared by the following thing. China, the central government, can buy every share of equity in the London Stock Exchange. China can buy twice as much as all the shares listed in the Australian Stock Exchange. That's how much purchasing power of the four trillion US dollar currency reserves being able to do. So money matters. Now you may ask, well, the, all these numbers are fancy numbers, are government numbers. What, how, does, how does it relate to me? Housing. Chinese investors and families are going abroad buying houses. In this picture, we see Chinese tourists slash investors walking into a beautiful house, I think in California. They are trying to buy this house. If they decide to buy, they use cash. They cannot go to Bank America or go to Citibank to get the credits, to get the loans. They use cash. So money also matters. The impact of China is felt all over the world. Ideology matters also. China today is not recognized as a democracy. Whereas Germany, after the, its first being established in 1872, was arguably an emerging, an emerging democracy. Do you know that in the first Reich, in the first incarnation of the German federal, gov federal system, the German election rate was higher than Britain. Germany, in the First Reich, can be better called a democracy than Britain. So Germany, by ideological standard, did not th pose a threat to France or to the UK. It's democracy. It's more democratic than the UK. How about Japan? Japan, don't forget, was occupied by the US at the end of World War II. The Japanese constitution, here is the version of the Chinese, the picture of Chinese, of the Japanese, here's the picture of the Japanese constitution. Was written by a legal, by a law student from the US. Historians told me she was a young law school student from the US. Somebody told me that she didn't even graduate when she wrote the Japanese constitution. Japan still has US military base, even though may or may not be popular with the Japanese population. But ideological wise, nobody sees Japan as a threat in the West. China, to the contrary, is not recognized as democracy. Here's the picture of Chinese National People's Congress meeting. Members of the delegates of the National People's Congress are not directly elected. Rather, they were indirectly elected by members of subsidiary People's Congress. There's dispute about what is democracy. But it's fair to say China is not de democracy recognized by many Western countries. I'm not get, trying to get into any disputes. I'm stating a fact. Meanwhile, China is run by a ruling party, by constitution. Here's constitution. The, con the, the preamble of Chinese constitution says, China is led by the Communist Party in coalition with many other parties. But the Communist Party is the ruling party. 
Notice the key word is Communist Party, which is a good word in China, in, many, in the minds of many people, but may not be in the minds of many Western friends, in the high minds of Western friends. Therefore, ideology is a potential issue between China and the rest of the world. And finally, why China is an intriguing number two in the world it is because the potential matters. China is number two in the world today in terms of size of GDP, but the potential is even higher. You may argue that China may come into the Japanese, Japanese trouble, having two decades of uh, slumps, of slowing down. Imagine China follows the path of not, the not so successful economic development experience of Latin America. I'm not downplaying Latin America, I'm just stating a fact. The Latin American countries, including Argentina, may not be the textbook cases of economic development. Imagine China follows the path from now on, the Latin American path of growth. Here is the picture. In about 25 or 30 years, China's per capita income will be 35% of the U.S. Today, remind you, China's per capita income adjusted for its purchasing power, that is, we are using one U.S. dollar to 3.5 RMB. China's per capita income is only 20%. From 20% to 35% of per U.S. income. If that's the case, if the Latin America's today's future of China, then in 20 years, Chinese GDP will be 1.5 times as large as the U.S. economy. Imagine that. This is not the most optimistic future for China. If you tell Chinese friends, oh, you will, be, will become Latin American country in terms of economic performance, people wouldn't be very happy. But yet, the size is already huge. And this is the reason for China to be so intriguing.